Welcome uh, to the third Baker uh, Institute conference on tax reform and expenditure reform. So we've had one in 1998. Uh, we had another conference in 2006, and this is our third conference. Uh, the previous two conferences have ended up with publications of volumes on tax reform. And we're looking forward to publishing a volume uh, from this conference, uh, thankfully to the hard work of the participants. So just like to start by thanking the participants for, for their work and uh, their contribution to the conference. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the, Peters, the Peterson Foundation and Ernst & Young LLP for financial support. Uh, I welcome you and thank you for attending. Hope that you learn a lot. Uh, and that it's informative, and that you, you walk away um, not too depressed. Uh, because things have, have gotten pretty bad. So, so the focus of the conference is, is, is the long-run fiscal challenges facing the United States uh, and the potential for budget and economic reforms uh, to, to both solve the long-run budget problem as well as uh, sustain short-term economic viability. Uh, one of the major issues of, of doing that is health care. So without any further ado, let's introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Polly, an expert in the field of health care and health budgets, and we'll get this party started. <coughs> Thanks, John. Um, so I was actually going to start by apologizing for being depressing. Um, oh, John already did it because when he first wrote me, he said, could you please g give us a paper to tell us how to control health care spending growth and improve quality at the same time? And I said, well, if that's what I have to say, I shouldn't come. Uh, now, I will actually give you an example or two of uh, my favorites. I don't think it's a perf perfectly depressing world. I think there are some examples of ways where you can lower spending growth or at least lower the level of spending and improve quality. But my main punchline is going to be at least the ones I know of um, don't amount to enough. Uh, to um, uh, um, cool down the uh, enormous furnace in the basement, which is um, stoking the rate of growth of health care spending. Um, so uh, that's going to be a little bit depressing, if I can speak of pressing. The usual problem. There we go. Um, uh, the uh, main apology, though, that I have for uh, for being somewhat uh, uh, downbeat about this is uh, reminds me of the advice that was given by my econometrics professor when we were talking about forecasting. He said, always forecast what you don't want to have happen. You'll either be prophetic or you'll be pleasantly surprised. So I'm going to forecast what I don't want to have happen, but, prob but I think probably will, and at least tell you some of the options there. And I guess another way to give my last um, element of apology is the optimism here mostly comes in the direction of my offering you some advice on what I think is the best of a bad lot or at least uh, there's nothing so bad that it can't get worse if you aren't careful. So at least there may be some ways to uh, mitigate or alleviate uh, the problem, and I will be uh, you know, toward the end my personal opinion on uh, ones that uh, policies that move in that direction versus ones that I think are probably likely to make things worse. Well, uh, for much, much of this audience, I know what I have to say here will be very familiar, uh, but I did want to kind of lay out the general ideas, and there was at least one light bulb that went on for me, which I'll point to when we get there, although other people may have already noticed it, uh, that I think helped me to think about uh, both why we have this problem and why it's hard to solve, and in a way what the nature of the solution will be, but what we probably need to fasten our seatbelts about uh, when we um, talk about solutions. So to begin with the problem, the problem is a fiscal accounting problem as indicated there. 
um, tax or debt financed uh, public sector expenditures for health insurance are high and rising faster than any economic aggregate you could think of, um, the tax base, GDP, or virtually anything else. And that's posing problems for the budget, pu public budget now and more so in the future. Well, why can't we, we quote unquote, do something about it? Uh, part of the problem is, well, even in terms of projections of future costs, and they're not really costs, they're spending. I have to put on my economist hat and say that. But whatever they are, however accurate we know those, those we have little information on their causes or their benefits, so we don't really know what to do. So I'll try to tell you at least what I know about what to do, and we'll get there. This, uh, so I thought about um, giving you some mind-numbing charts from the trustees' report, from the Medicare trustees, about health care spending growth. But then I came across this chart from, Andy Rett, uh, from Chris Conover rather, at Duke, uh, which has in it actually, I think, in one slide, almost everything you need to know about health care spending. So you see that's a chart where it's the percentage of um, GDP spent on health, government health spending at all levels, I think, and a government non-health spending. And uh, well, first of all, what you're supposed to notice is if we start in 1966, which is when I started in healthcare, thank goodness Medicare, as a side effect, provided some funding for PhD students to write theses in healthcare. Otherwise, I'd still be working on the incidence of the corporation income tax, and I wouldn't have had nearly as happy a life. Well, so if you begin there, uh, as you can see, that, bo that gold bar is getting bigger and bigger uh, over time, so it tells you what you already know. Healthcare spending is growing. More, growing rapidly and growing more rapidly than GDP. Then what you can also see on this wonderful <coughs> chart is the size of the gold bar is growing relative to the size of the red bar. So what it tells you is in the total government budget, uh, health care is becoming a larger and larger share of total government spending. Then actually the main point that Chris wanted to make in the headline is um, if you just set aside the creeping socialism years of 2008, 2009, um, roughly when uh, when the red bars jumped up, uh, roughly speaking, the um, uh, uh, um, there, there's bouncing around, of course, but roughly speaking, um, almost all of the growth in the share of government, uh, share of GDP going to government, is at least um, accountable by, or uh, if you counted it up, we're not sure about causation here, but if you counted it up, it's all healthcare all the time. Um, I remember back in graduate school, I uh, can't remember his name now, but there was an Australian economist who had the theory uh, that when government expenditure reached 25% of GDP, it was like the fall of the Roman Empire, the whole world would collapse. Um, I think we've, we've blown past 25%. That's what the chart tells you. But if there's anything that's going to bring down the Roman Empire, kind of the message here, it's health care. Um, what you're also supposed to notice is, uh, because this will be important a little bit later on, is that the proportion going for non-health care, um, although there was this kind of flat spot in the 90s and the early thousands, uh, has been more or less constant uh, 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 since um, 1966. And then finally, uh, you can't see it on the chart, but if we projected it out further, what I think all projections would tell you is that not only will the total rise, but that health care bar will rise, and it will rise more rapidly than the red bar uh, for a couple of reasons. I'll just enumerate them. One uh, is, um, as I'm painfully aware every day, the aging of the population. There's going to be more people on Medicare. Uh, second, uh, and this is actually important, health care spending per beneficiary, whether Medicare, Medicaid, or any other government program also grows at a rapid rate. And thirdly, there are going to be some additional people added to two other uh, federal programs, one Medicaid, 15 or 20 percent more as the uh, able-bodied uh, poor are put on Medicaid. And uh, uh, although we're not quite sure, or I'm not sure I trust the numbers, uh, there is the program in the Accountable Care Act, assuming it happens, uh, to subsidize health insurance coverage for lower middle income population up to 400 percent of the poverty line. Um, I'll just editorialize and say I think the budget projections for the cost of that are way low because I am convinced once it's in place, lower middle income people will figure out a way to configure their employment in order to qualify for those fairly generous subsidies. So you put that 
that all together, you're looking way out in the future at some high rates of um, spending relative to GDP. I think most people kind of know the numbers or have been scared to death by the numbers from the trustees' report. Somewhere between 2035 and 2050, we're looking at, for Medicare spending as a fraction of a GDP, a doubling or a tripling. Uh, these other components probably won't go up quite that fast, but doubling seems like a pretty good guess. And it's the end of the Roman Empire, uh, at least according to the Australian economist. And uh, after all, if you say the end of the world is at hand, sooner or later you'll be right. So, uh, well, why is this? Why is this true? Uh, so here's my take on it. I don't think an enemy has done this. I think, in fact, the growing healthcare spending is a result of really good news. There are two important pieces of good news. One is that uh, people's real incomes are rising. Uh, at least they were, uh, and hopefully they will again. Uh, so that's, I think, good news as compared to the alternative. Um, that's what my dad told me on his 100th birthday when I said, how is it to be 100? And I said, better than the alternative. And uh, um, same thing here, but, but, or and, or just as a fact, it seems clear that when people do get higher real incomes, they want to devote some chunk of it to spending on things that will improve the quantity and quality of their lives to the extent that they have control over that and actually have to pay for some of it. Of course, we're down to only about people paying out of pocket 10 cents on the dollar, but you can buy health care by your choice of health plan, whether you choose the latest with the mostest health plan or the wait and see when it comes to new technology health plan, neither of which actually actually exists, but I think ought to, to give people choices, but you can make a choice there. So that's the first part. Uh, citizens want to spend more on current quality medical care as their incomes rise. And um, probably most Im more important, as every health economist knows, uh, the uh, largest share of uh, healthcare spending growth is attributable to uh, what we call changes in technology, or sometimes called um, uh, the residual factor, because the dirty little secret is it really is just the statistical residual after you take out the things you can identify, and we say it must be technology. Um, on the other hand, people have looked at this fairly closely, um, at least with regard to some of the important diseases like cardiovascular disease, and I'm thinking here of David Cutler's work, have come to the conclusion that, yes, there was a substantial improvement in technology in the treatment of cardiovascular disease and stroke. Yes, it did add to spending, but also, yes, it, the, the improvements in health were worth more than the increment in spending. So that's what consumers wanted, presumably, and it's a good... So those are two good things. We have higher real incomes. We, have, we can live longer and better than we ever could. And then you cue the theme music from Jaws. The problem is uh, the, that when we do all of that, we spend um, more than we did in the past. And uh, uh, I, um, I'm actually going to look up the his history of this word. All economists know there are normal goods, which are goods you spend more on as your income rises. And um, I never actually, I think, was taught this, but I came to call goods where when your income rises by 10%, you spend more than 10% as luxury goods. And that seems to be what health care is. Uh, so, so far, at least from the beginning of time up to the present, it's a luxury good, uh, a good that uh, people want to, their spending to grow at a higher rate than their income. Of course, a good can't be a luxury good forever, and it'll lead up your entire income, uh, but as long as you're not too greedy, uh, it can be a luxury good for quite a long time. And one of my favorite papers is by um, uh, Bob Hall and Charles Jones, uh, that was published in the QJE, where they build a model basically of this process of growing real income and technology, and then forecasted what would that be predicted to do to the healthcare share of GDP by 2050, and they predicted a 34% share, and they were happy about it because that was what people wanted to do. So that's that part. So is this a problem? Uh, so um, it's, of course, worth saying, uh, you know, insurers um, are, um, the reason they're paid the big bucks is because they're subject to the danger of killing the messenger, and they are the messenger. But the primary reason uh, for rising in insurance premiums uh, is uh, rising claims, uh, not, not um, rising profits or rising wages of insurance executives, although personally I don't understand why they get paid so much. It's, it's easy work. But in any case, uh, that's, that's sort of the story. 
And um, so rising spending for private spending, um, at least I'll argue here, although I am, I'm an economist, so I can argue with myself later on if you object, but I think it probably represents what people want to do, which they accommodate by increasing on their spending at a lower rate than income. And there are other categories of luxury goods. I once looked these up. Computers and peripherals for home use are an example of a luxury good. Entertainment and sporting events is another luxury good. We have them, and we like them. And I don't know if you're Bobby McFerrin fan, or if there are any of them left to remember Bobby. But my, my reaction to this on the private side is, don't worry, be happy. Uh, and then cue the Calypso beat. Uh, but it's a problem for government. That's where I'm going here. Uh, and here's the problem. Um, tax bases, at least all the ones I know of, even if, if you're lucky, increase at about the same rate as GDP. And some of them, like the payroll tax, increase at a lower rate than GDP. So uh, if you are going to hold uh, the um, uh, rate of growth of other components of spending constant, like Chris Conover's chart did, and if there's not going to be an increase in the deficit, um, you, th there's a kind of, um, uh, this was what surprised me once I thought about it, probably everybody else already knew about it, but what surprised me was that means that you're going to have to have ever increasing tax rates to finance health care. So this is not something that's going to go away as long as it continues to be a luxury good. If it's paid for by government, tax rates are going to have to get higher and higher because it, it, the desired level of spending, if you're to keep up with it, it being a luxury good, will rise relative to income, which means tax rates have to rise relative to income. And so, uh, to, to sort of understate the obvious, the public sector has a hard time with increasing tax rates, even for good things, which I think this mostly is, but for good reasons. And here's, what, here's the good reasons. Um, the first one is, uh, from my public choice days, um, it's my perception that public choice has a harder time than private choice in making continuous trade-offs between alternative good things. One of the maxims I remember is an old, an old tax is a good tax, or a good tax is an old tax, and ditto for a budget. And so if you have to keep shifting budgets continuously year after year, uh, that really causes political consternation. Uh, the second sentence there is kind of the Lake Wobegon version of a political s politician slogan. No category of spending should grow less rapidly than average, especially not that of my own favorite special interest or my department or whatever. Um, and uh, setting aside the political difficulty of making the required shifts, which I argue in any way people can do privately, it may be that the things that have to grow more slowly are private, which means the government still has a problem. It's got no place to shift it to. So that's the first part. The second part actually is smaller in space on this slide, but probably more important in terms of importance, at least in terms of my current thinking, is while rising taxes, all economists know, generate excess burden. The idea that when you um, uh, make a transfer from the private sector to government, using at least um, all the tax bases we currently have that we think are equitable, the head tax, of course, is an exception, but we don't believe in that anymore. So using all the tax bases we currently have, people respond to the t uh, increase in the tax base, not only by transferring resources to the public sector, but also by changing their behavior in ways that impose costs. Some of it's explicit. You spend more to hire tax advisors. Uh, you build a house in the Cayman Islands or whatever it might be. Some of it, actually most of it in the empirical estimates, seem to be harder to detect and somewhat more debatable. But I think the general consensus here is these things are pretty big. Uh, you supply less uh, work or less effort, especially if you are a woman or a teenager. Uh, and I guess if you're a millionaire or a billionaire, you create fewer jobs. So uh, whatever you're going to be doing there, you're not going to be doing as much of it when it's more heavily taxed compared to when it's less heavily taxed. Estimates of this, of course, is kind of an amorphous concept. It's kind of hard to explain it to ordinary people, but um, economists believe they've already figured it out, so uh, we, we think they must know. Uh, Estimates range from 25 cents on the dollar to 200 cents on the dollar, or for, to collect a dollar of taxes, uh, collect three dollars in taxes, only one third of it will actually, uh, no, sorry, uh, to collect a dollar in taxes, you cost two dollars worth of distortion to the rest of the economy. I am not going to take a position here, although I'm, after I wrote this down, I decided to go back and look at this a little more carefully, but it, it seems large enough to matter. And, and in a way, this is the translation of the Australian economist view of the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's, not, it's not abrupt. It's going to be continuous. Actually, the fall of the Roman Empire was not abrupt. It was continuous because they chased the Goths out and reestablished the capital.
capital at Ravenna, but then 200 years later went down to tubes. Anyway, um, and um, uh, that 200% number didn't just come out of the air. There's a recent paper by Kate Baker and John Skinner trying to estimate the excess burden of the taxes that would be needed to finance health reform and the extra spending on health reform. And depending on the nature of the tax instrument, they can get up that high. Um, as you can imagine, um, it works the way you would expect. If the taxes are paid via income tax, uh, there's a higher excess burden than if they're paid uh, via um, uh, payroll tax. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, uh, it, but, it, but no matter how you slice it, unless we're going to go back to head taxes, there's a substantial cost to the economy from, from, um, from raising taxes. And this is sort of the microeconomics version of the unending macroeconomic argument about will high, tax, will high taxes kill the American economy um, slowly. Is the answer. Uh, okay, so what can we do then in the face of uh, these facts, or at least according to me, facts? Uh, what are our alternative strategies? So I tried to outline three strategies here. Um, so one is, um, and this is actually what, at least as I read, most of the discussion of bending the cost curve or what to do about healthcare spending growth, or even I think what John was reading when he asked me to write about, what he asked me to write about is, can't we have magic? at least this time? Can't we have magic? Can't we find a way to slow the growth of spending permanently while still improving outcomes at the old rate? Uh, we want it so much. Why can't it be so? Um, and sometimes it is. So my favorite solution, just to show that I'm not totally pessimistic, is work I've done with one of my colleagues in the nursing school called Transitional Care Nursing. Her name is Mary Naylor, and uh, we published a um, uh, 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 random, uh, 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 randomized clinical trials to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you are an old person in the hospital and we connect you with a specially trained nurse uh, and you and your family in the hospital who will help you when you exit the hospital, not, uh, that will have an enormous impact. Not only will you be happier and your health be better, uh, but it will dramatically lower the rate of readmission to hospital, uh, which is a slam dunk in terms of cost saving, basically because the specially trained nurse, for one thing, runs interference between the family and the doctor. Uh, and for another thing, uh, the specially trained nurse is the person you call when you say mother's having problems, should we pile her in the station wagon and take her to the ER? And the specially trained nurse says, no, you don't have to do that, and uh, here's what you should do. So it seems to work like a charm. Other people are more optimistic than I. David Cutler is probably the optimist in chief here, at least as far as I know, although Mark McClellan's pretty close behind to name some names. Um, and um, a person, I guess, can have differences of opinion about this. Um, I, uh, as you, as I've already warned you, I'm not a super optimist. The ways that I know to save money um, and improve quality, they should definitely be done, but they're not enough relative to the problem. And even more, and this is the absolute most important thing to think about, all the things I know of and all the things, at least 99%, I'm going to have a slide that says this later on, that I know that other people have written about, even if I don't believe them, are what are called level shifters. They are things you can do to lower cost, but um, after you've lowered costs, as you move people from the old thing to the new thing, if the furnace in the basement, which is the improving technology, continues to pump heat into the building, the temperature will still rise. Throw open the window, it helps for a little while, but eventually it gets hot again and you can't stand it. So that seems to be what's going on, and um, I, the windmill I've been tilting at for years is to tell people you ought to, um, not that you shouldn't pay attention to these level shifters and things like excessive administrative costs or even information technology, uh, um, but you ought to pay attention to what's causing costs to grow, which is uh, improved technology. So my simple solution to control healthcare spending is just abolish the NIH. Uh, that, that would do it, but I'm not sure that may have adverse side effects. Anyway, there, there's still some hope, some optimism there, which I will dump on in just a minute, but I wanted to put it up there as a, a possible strategy. Strategy number two is bend the total spending curve. Either get beneficiaries, beneficiaries to stop wanting so much more or stop them from getting what they want. So I view this as kind of the draconian uh, cap Medicare spending, cap health care, or maybe total health care spending. That was what Harry and Louise were worried about at their kitchen table, remember, and I think it still could come up because for Pete's sake, we have to do something, um, stop them from getting what they want. And then may come as no surprise, 
Uh, but I favor uh, strategy three is I might as well tell you is the one I favor, which is to say let's get the public subsidy spend growth rate under control, and then if people want to buy new technology above and beyond that they can, but they should use their money, not our money, or not the taxpayers' money, or more specifically, not money raised by the inefficient device of taxation. They should instead use the efficient device of reaching in your wallet or reaching in your checkbook and buying new technology. So let me just say a few words about some of those things. The problem gets worse, though. I think this is more of a political problem, but I think it's worthwhile to rub our noses in it just so we don't get too happy. Uh, if we can bring the rate of growth of spending in the, of publicly financed health care under control, uh, which I think uh, we inevitably are going to have to do, uh, the problem is that if uh, in the private side people are still viewing health care as a luxury good they want more of, what you're going to have is two-class medicine or maybe multi-class medicine, uh, uh, the, I'm not going to waste my money on a concierge doctor, but you might. Uh, so that would be the top class. Um, uh, and uh, that's going to cause political problems, I guess, or at least we have to face up to it. I think I'll say the obvious thing. It's going to be most acute if you follow, follow strategy number two, if you tell people you cannot... Um, uh, if you are on a public program, and I'm thinking especially here of Medicare, we don't mind two-class medicine for Medicaid. Medicaid already is two-class medicine. But if we put people on Medicare, on a Medicaid-like regimen, which I think is um, the only thing to do to control Medicare's growth if you're not going to go to the um, premium support subsidy version, um, it's going to grow less rapidly, but there will be less for people uh, when they turn 65 than before they're 65, um, and that's going to cause uh, consternation. And who knows what's going to happen with exchanges. Uh, well, just a few comments on the solutions, then a few comments on some other remedies, and I'll wrap up. Uh, solution strategy number one, a lot of great ideas out there. My fundamental view is give it a shot. Don't put the champagne on ice, but give it a shot. But, but this is actually a word from the actuaries in the, actuar in the trustees' report. The, the uh, 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 generation of sufficient uh, cost-reducing, uh, quality-improving strategies in healthcare enough to slow the rate of growth of healthcare spending permanently, at least substantially, is unprecedented. That doesn't mean it can never happen, but hasn't happened yet. 90% of solutions are unproven visions. Uh, we have a randomized controlled trial for transitional care nursing, but most of these others are good ideas or things that work in certain isolated parts of the country that may not generalize to others. What works in Danville, Pennsylvania, I think is going to have a hard time in Philadelphia. Oh, golly, I wish Geisinger would show up. And 98% are one time not permanent because they don't really address the fundamental problem. Solution to strategy two, I'm not in favor of this, but it may be inevitable for poor people. I think we're already doing that. At least some states are uh, for poor people. And uh, again, if we're going to uh, deal with that excess burden cost, we uh, probably have to look forward to doing it for more poor people. Uh, for Medicare, this implies future reimbursement policy that says to providers, and I gave this talk at the Penn Health System to the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, executive suite yesterday, uh, but they were all, they said they already knew this was going to happen. Uh, the government's going to come to them and say, here's how much money you have. Do the best you can. That's all the money we've got. Don't tell us you can't do it. You can do something for this money. Uh, just do it as gracefully as you can. We're going to bundle it so you can't raise extra money by wiggling around. We're just going to pay it per person that's signed up with you. Does that violate what we were promised? We senior citizens, I don't know. Uh, but the lid will blow off, I think. I, that's my prediction. Then my favorite is, um, uh, which I made a contribution to in 2004, although there are other people who have uh, talked about premium support well before that, uh, you have an implicit voucher. There is actually an implicit voucher already present in Medicare. It just at the moment is tied to the cost of the government-run program, but it could be hooked on to something else. You limit the growth in the tax finance voucher to what taxpayers decide they can afford, given um, uh, uh, excess burden cost. Uh, some rough calculations I made in 2004, I want to give you some good news, said that if we take uh, Medicare spending at today's rate, we freeze it in real terms, meaning we keep it up with economy-wide inflation, so we're not taking anything away from my demographic. Whatever we got, we're allowed to keep. Um, uh, 
we can almost make it with current tax rates because the excess growth of the elderly population is just about equal if you're something of an optimist uh, to the growth in productivity uh, in the working part of the population. Plus, let's throw in a little, a few immigrant workers or maybe a lot of them to make payments. And um, we should all have, uh, not we, uh, beyond me, but some, some people should have more children who will eventually become workers. So the uh, basic focus of this is to say we're going to make beneficiaries pay, but we're only going to make them pay for new technology, not existing technology. We are going to guarantee something. Um, and so the criticism that this will cause a reduction in uh, support for Medicare, I think, is unwarranted because the alternative of keeping up today's Medicare is impossible. So um, my own view is if we followed strategy two and made Medicare kind of look like the D.C. public schools, uh, that would probably erode support a lot more than keeping up um, at least a, a modicum of public support for the entire Medicare population, but asking those people who can uh, to pay a little bit more. And so that was my idea, and a lot of other people, including Paul Ryan, have talked about this in various ways. Means test the supplement. Don't means test the whole thing, but means test the supplement. Warren Buffett and I will have to pay for new technology if we want it, but only if we want it that much. And he's a modest person, and so am I, so maybe we'll decide to go with uh, the old technology. Then we choose among plans using different cost-effectiveness rules for the adoption and use of new technology. Um, I think uh, my vision, this is only a vision I have after a few beers, but it is something like there would be different Medicare plans out there. I'm still teaching, so I don't have to go on Medicare. I'm terrified. But when I do, uh, the plans would say there'd be the 50,000 per quality adjusted life year plan whose rationing rule would be we add new technology. If it costs $50,000 or less, there'd be the 100,000, the 200,000. I think I'd go for about the $300,000 per quality adjusted life year. That's what my wife tells me I'm worth. But we'll see. Uh, anyway, that would be the, so I think it could be done, at least in uh, the way economists think about things. Um, I won't talk about these things too much um, other than to say uh, it, it's tricky to means test Medicare and to raise a lot of money there because um, of the phenomenon that even upper middle class people, once they turn 65, their income goes away. And so it's hard to raise a lot of money there. And I, I don't know an easy answer to that. Um, and then I'm on the side of the angels here to do two other things, which is tax resource guzzling Medigap plans, which impose costs on the public Medicare plan and get rid of the private insurance tax exclusion. Uh, Rivlin and Domenici thought that if you uh, took away the tax exclusion, that would be enough to slow down the growth in the private side so you wouldn't have this invidious comparison to class. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I kind of doubt it. Um, I won't talk much about this. just shows what you could do with means testing. So that's the good news. Uh, you could do something uh, in terms of the share of GDP. But I do need to say, even to get down to 40%, you're down to 400% of the poverty line among seniors. That's about $58,000 a year. So to make well-off seniors pay more for their Medicare, you have to define well-off to include people that um, don't think of themselves well-off, even if they might have been well-off before they went and retired. Is there magic in competitive markets? There's no for stronger defender of competitive markets than me, um, but I part company with Representative Ryan by imagining that you can wave the magic wand of competition and all your problems will go away. Give it a shot, again, is my view here. Let's have more competitive markets and see what they do. Uh, but um, uh, I guess I didn't actually put the main benefit of having competitive markets down there, which is if we did have them, then at least um, a market-oriented economist would be able to stop whining and we could see whether the rate of growth of spending that people would choose in competitive markets was a higher or lower rate than what it is now. And if it ended up being a high, high rate still, that must mean it's because they want it and they've chosen it in well-functioning markets. So I guess that's uh, sort of the story here. I think we should really give uh, it a shot, namely this uh, idea of constraining, uh, having a budget-constrained uh, voucher. Allow choice among competitive plans to allow people to make their own trade-offs. I guess philosophically, um, this was what I call the best of a bad lot or name your poison. There has to be some imposition of fiscal discipline that's got to slow the rate of growth of health care spending, particularly among seniors. And I guess my predilection is I'd rather choose that myself than have it chosen collectively. Uh, so that's sort of the vision here. Uh, and then economists can shut up. Conclusions, political economy. Politicians have to stop saying what they want and start talking about what they can have. That's easy for me to say. I have tenure, but I thought I would say it. Uh, 
we need to have leaner medical Christmases. It's not that we're going to take anything away. My dad always used to tease us, kids, it's a bad year. I don't know what Santa's going to be able to bring this year. Of course, it was always an orgy afterwards, but uh, because Santa was always very generous. But uh, we need a leaner medical Christmases. We don't need to uh, take away things, but we need to stop adding so many things. We must probably do so for 100% public clients, the poor. Uh, it's going to be the best of the bad lot for a non-poor. And then we need graceful language. I have a slogan. I try to do this for my marketing students, come up with health insurance plan slogans that I think are painfully honest, just to have them tell me it'll never work. So I have the Philly Health Plan, whose slogan is, we're not that great, but we sure are cheap. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, and I guess continuing on the message, that's the sort of depressing uh, theme, I think, that uh, we're, somebody's going to have to say in some obviously more graceful words at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polly. Uh, our first discussant will be Dr. Vivian Ho from Rice University and the Baker Institute. Thanks, thanks, John. I, I was delighted that um, to hear that Mark accepted the invitation, uh, John's invitation, to come here and speak. Um, because he really is a unique combination in terms of someone who understands the health insurance uh, markets and, and demand for health insurance so well, plus, as you can see, his knowledge of public finance. So um, it was really a pleasure to read the paper that he prepared um, for this, this uh, particular talk. Um, so... Uh, so, so what, what, what Mark explains to us is, is, is the underlying uh, sources of medical spending uh, growth, and, and in particular, if you remember, um, technology plays an extremely important role, both in terms of new technologies that have been introduced uh, over the last two or three decades, plus greater use of high technology um, in general by, uh, by patients. And the other thing which, which I hadn't known was the issue of um, higher wage growth in the, in the healthcare industry. So high higher wage growth than in other sectors of the economy. So we actually are seeing um, higher incomes for physicians and for nurses and other types of providers, which I thought was a, you know, sort of a fact which is um, not, not um, made well aware amongst health economists. And of course, um, you saw his, uh, his graph uh, from, uh, from Dr. Conover, the, the current growth rate, all I could say is just easily it's going to bury us or the end of the fall of the Roman Empire. And um, publicly financed increases in medical spending are are just inefficient. Okay, so that's what we know, and the solution that doc, uh, Dr. Polly proposes is that uh, we should send specify two spending growth rates, all right? One for uh, low-income individuals, so those who are going to need 100% subsidies from the government to receive their health care, um, which is uh, the poor and the near poor, and then we want to be specifying um, uh, the growth rate that we're going to agree on to finance um, publicly for the rest of the population, and, and the idea with that particular um, growth also being means tested and those who can afford it who want more luxury health care are going to be spending out of their wallet, which certainly makes sense in terms of services. Okay, and so the way that you um, achieve this capping and spending growth is you implement a voucher system, where in this case the voucher is a fixed predetermined amount, um, and then and then that particular amount provided by the government is supplemented by individuals' own private spending, and then beneficiaries could also uh, have choices of uh, various different private um, private uh, providers and insurers provide you know who would who would uh, take this voucher, and also that there could be a public option as well. Okay, so he's quite quite flexible in terms of this type of market market based approach, and I think that makes a great deal of sense. Um, so so I, all of this actually makes makes a good uh, deal of sense to me. I would just like to add a corollary in terms of um, controlling spend, spending growth, um, because I don't think we are going to get this this growth under control until we reform the way in which we um, our, our sort of payment incentives um, are structured, and in terms of what physicians and hospitals are rewarded for um, uh, providing in the current healthcare system. And um, it, it's uh, uh, sort of generally known by health economists and, and said over and over um, that Medicare and other other types of um, health insurance systems reward providers for higher quantity of services, and they don't necessarily have good rewards for the quality of the services that are being provided. 
Okay, and so for example, um, this paper um, by, done by Mark McClellan in his early years, he looks at the hospital DRG system. So this is the way that Medicare reimburses um, hospitals for the care they provide to its beneficiaries. All right, um, DRGs were meant to be um, providing uh, a fixed reimbursement for a particular type of diagnosis. So if a patient came in, for example, with a heart attack, then there should be a fixed payment rate regardless of how long the patient stays and what types of resources are utilized. And as long as you um, give a reasonable amount of reimbursement, you'll get hospitals to admit these patients, and it gives incentives for hospitals to um, control their costs because then they would keep the profits, which is the difference between the DRG reimbursement rate and their, their particular costs. Okay, but it turns out this DRG system, when it was structured, was not structured all that well, and so actually 40% of DRGs are not for a diagnosis. They're actually for a particular procedure, and many of these reimbursement rates are quite generous. And so, um, you know, so, so you can actually, for example, the example I give here is open heart surgery. You get many, you get much more reward for doing more open heart surgeries. But you don't get so much reward, um, for example, for saying, well, we're, we're going to medically manage this particular patient, even though clinical guidelines actually may, may, may make sense that it would be better to medically manage a particular patient with a heart attack or do something less aggressive, such as an angioplasty. Okay, so that's, that's the way the current reimbursement uh, system is structured. And, and it's the same thing with physicians. They get more reimbursements per service. Okay, and, 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 and it's based on sort of CPT codes, which are um, structured by the AMA, and not necessarily for the quality. So they're going to get more reimbursements, a cardiologist, for doing angioplasties and EKGs and all these types of procedures, whereas they, um, what we should be trying to do is, is, is reward these particular physicians for monitoring these patients early on, getting them to lower their cholesterol, practice better diets, and and um, stop smoking, and, and there are just no financial incentives built in the current system to get physicians to behave that way. Okay, so what this creates is inefficiencies in the healthcare system, and I've just got a couple of examples here. Uh, for example, there's been a study which has looked at um, spinal pain um, patients or back problem patients, and the real cost is increased by, of caring for these patients, increased by about $1,500 over the course of um, eight years, but they went on and measured 24 different um, measures of outcomes for these patients in, in mental health, physical functioning, work school limitations, social limitations. They were all worse, okay? Every single measure that they could think of actually became worse, so where did our money actually go to? Uh, another example from a, a different study, only 44% of Medicare patients had stress tests prior to angioplasty, okay? Even though this is recommended by guidelines by the American Cardi College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, that these patients should be receiving stress, uh, stress tests before receiving aggressive treatment. And you look at that, Medicare um, pays for over 800,000 of these procedures per year, and they're 10 to $15,000 each. Okay, lots of examples you can find in the medical literature of cases where physicians are encouraged to, well, not really encouraged, but, but there certainly seems to be a good financial payoff to practicing in, uh, medicine in this way. Some other examples, growth in the use of um, um, high-tech diagnostic scanning um, due to physician self-referral. Okay, so physicians can self-refer these patients to their own clinics to make additional money off of these diagnostic tests. The Wall Street Journal looked at intensity modulated radiation therapy for prostate, camp, uh, prostate cancer patients and couldn't justify the growth that they spotted. Okay, and so, so I think there's the, 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 the point where, where perhaps Mark and I might disagree is, is, he, um, is, is the issue of the pro proportionality of these, um, these increases in inefficiencies. I actually do think they, are propor they do proportionately explain increases in uh, medical cost growth over time. And that's because as the technologies be become more complex, there is more asymmetric information between the patient and the provider. And the higher reimbursement rates that are associated with these higher cost technologies create more incentive for physicians to be sort of over-prescribing some of these types of treatments. And so, for example, if you look at this study that looked at CT, MRI, and PET screening, PET screening is the most expensive. And um, this particular study I found found a 400% increase in growth of PET screening over the course of four years, whereas it was only a 50% increase in um, MRI and CT uh, scanning over that same time. In terms of the um, IMRT therapy for prostate cancer patients, 
Um, Medicare reimburses about $40,000 per patient for that treatment, whereas prostatectomy is only $16,000, okay? In that particular study, the Wall Street Journal found the clinical guidelines specify you shouldn't be providing IMRT to patients who are 80 years or older, and the particular practice they looked at um, actually treated 91 patients over the age of 80 with this, okay? So um, I'd like to be a little bit more positive and um, and in some of the statements that Mark McClellan makes about healthcare and, and where we can go in terms of these particular provider incentives. So you'll see this, this quote here, stronger incentives for consumers to choose less costly insurance plans coupled with reliable evidence on their quality and cost may lead to greater uptake of benefit, benefit designs that provide much larger financial awards to consumers who choose more efficient care. In turn, this could create much stronger pressure and a more favorable environment for more meaningful provider payment reforms to take hold. And so up here are listed some of the various different types of payment incentives that Mark McClellan talks about in a paper, and um, a, a recent paper just this year in the Journal of Economic per Perspectives. And these are actually all mechanisms that are built into the Affordable Care Act. Pay for reporting, pay for performance, bundled payments and accountable care organizations and capitation. Now, to be fair, um, Mark's, uh, Mark McClellan says in this paper, um, they, they, in, in the early trials, they, they, they're not, it's not as if they give you um, huge um, savings right away, but he is optimistic that some sort of, um, that as we, as we sort of build these, these, these types of reimbursement systems into, into Medicare and we learn more about them, that we will be able to achieve some reasonable cost savings. And, and um, you know, it's, it's going to, as always, you know, economists try and create in incentives and then we sort of put them into, into the real world and they don't sort of work the way we like. But I do think that this type of um, payment reform is an absolutely essential supplement to the type of voucher system that um, Dr. Polly proposed. And, and I hope that people consider that more. It's, it's sort of, you know, it, it's not just a health insurance problem here, that it's also a question of how we ac re actually reimburse our physicians and our hospitals. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, and our second discussant is Dr. Andrew Rettenmeyer from Texas A&M University. Well, I must say it's a it's a pleasure to discuss Mark's paper. Um, um, I've read uh, numerous papers by Mark over the years, and uh, this one, like the other ones, is uh, really well written. You'll uh, learn a lot, I think, in the process. Um, and um, for the non-economist, he puts things in ways that are quite understandable and explains kind of complex ideas that, uh, you know, you puzzle with uh, with your students. And uh, when you try to explain it to a non-economist, he does it really well. Um, so we've kind of gone through the main ideas already. Um, but again, um, uh, the main idea is that uh, uh, medical care is a superior good, a luxury good. It rises more rapidly than uh, uh, spending, uh, rises more rapidly than income. Um, uh, since we pay for it publicly, that's the problem. Uh, if we pay for it privately, uh, there are other things that we spend more on as our income rises, and, and we don't think about that. But government uh, payers account for about 45% of the national health expenditures. And um, when you couple that with uh, the tax expenditure on uh, the um, employer tax exclusion, you're looking at another two, uh, $200 billion. Um, so the end result is uh, health care spending uh, will grow as a share of uh, GDP with uh, rising real incomes, even, even if we just keep the government's share of payments uh, uh, constant. And then, then there's the discussion of the excess burden that uh, to, to get a dollar takes more than a dollar, um, and it rises the more we take. Um, so one thing that uh, 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 Mark suggests is that a natural um, place to uh, to limit growth in spending would be uh, through these uh, uh, 
tax finance vouchers for Medicare patients. Um, so <clears throat> I must say that uh, before I uh, uh, put up the next slide, I um, am a little um, cautious in doing so because uh, I'm going to uh, put up a slide that shows the healthcare spending as a percent of GDP. And in uh, Mark's paper, he writes, uh, correct evaluation is not helped by the silly share data. And instead, uh, should be based on asking about comparative value of resources used in medical care. So I, I put this uh, slide up with caution, but I'll explain why I'm doing it. Um, so if, um, if you're aware of the distribution of healthcare spending by payers, this is what, this is what it looks like over time. I take away from that that yes, when you, when you just look at the, the the percent of GDP spent on healthcare spending, that's totally consistent with uh, the idea that it's a uh, uh, healthcare is a luxury good, and we're going to shift our uh, consumption bundle towards this. But I think um, there's a lot of moving parts, uh, especially on in the form of uh, who pays for healthcare. I think the, the most telling in my mind is what happens with out-of-pocket spending. It uh, remains pretty constant over this entire uh, uh, time period, whereas uh, private health care, uh, private health insurance, Medicare, uh, Medicaid have been growing. Um, as a share, when we just look at the shares, if we now just say what's happened to out-of-pocket spending as a share of total personal health care spending, you can see that's been declining throughout this time period. So I guess some, uh, and economists have looked at this <coughs> for quite a long time, uh, trying to attribute how much of the growth is due to different sources. And uh, some of that, uh, you know, they, they've been careful to, to try to quantify the effect that's, um, that the amount that we can attribute to changing out-of-pocket out shares. I, I think uh, there's, we can continue to look at this and uh, think about what's happening to the real price of uh, health care consumption at the point of consumption, at the point of purchase. It hasn't changed that much in real terms. So <clears throat> this uh, next slide is just a continuation of the slide that, uh, that Mark put up. Um, but what I did here is just borrowed something from the, the most recent CBO um, long-term budget outlook. And this is non-interest non spending. And it's only federal government, not the state, and local, and federal like uh, a Mark slide had. But as you can see, it is all, you know, the, most of the, the things that we'll be talking about in this conference have to do with um, this rise in the health care spending. And that's, that's where it's coming from. In the, in the past and in the projections. Um, so uh, uh, another thing that Mark uh, mentioned was that uh, he, he didn't want to put up any of these mind-numbing slides uh, from uh, the trustees' report. So I'll put up the mind-numbing slides and, and I'll try to keep you awake. I, what, what I want you to see here is just the contrast between the 2009 and 2010 Medicare trustees' reports pre-Affordable Care Act score and the post-Affordable Care Act score. You can see they're quite different. And that's a consequence of the uh, assumptions that went into making the forecast. And, you know, the, the, the trustees and CBO try to um, score things as per current law. So current law would get us to this lower line as uh, expected by the Medicare trustees. Um, and primarily from the Office of the Actuary. In terms of uh, unfunded obligations, you know, we're talking about the uh, changing uh, the debt structure. These, these are not uh, necessarily government debts, and they're just uh, differences in flows uh, quantified at a single point in time. But you can see that the Affordable Care Act, if we believe the projections, really uh, changed the, debt, the future debt structure uh, the, the future expenditure structure that uh, uh, the United States federal government faces. But that's the caveat. Um, but before I go on, on, on to that, this is, this is uh, one of the things that uh, also was pointed out in Mark's paper. 
was uh, what would happen in the event that the Affordable Care Act strictures on um, uh, it, it maintains the sustainable growth rate and it in, requires uh, productivity adjustments that really scale down the growth in spending. Well, this is what would happen with Medicare spending per beneficiary divided by uh, national uh, health expenditures per capita. And you can see that you would get uh, uh, a system that in the, the, the top line, <coughs> the blue part is history, the green part, the top green part is the future based on the 2009 trustees report, but the lower line is based on what would happen with the 2010 uh, forecast. You can see they'd be quite a bit lower than uh, the rest of the uh, uh, spending. So the real question is, when we look at the strictures that are in the Affordable Care Act, will they uh, be realized? Primarily, will the sustainable growth rates be uh, maintained? We know that uh, Congress keeps repealing those. And will the uh, productivity adjustments stipulated by, stipulated by the Affordable Care Act be enforced? Well, this is what uh, also came out at the same time as the uh, um, 2010 trustees report. The, the trustees, the, the uh, actuaries actually put out an alternative forecast, the blue line, the dark blue line. Uh, remember, the, the, the original was 2009, the uh, after Affordable Care Act was scored, you get the lower blue line, but they said, you know, we don't think that's going to happen. And what we think is going to happen is the blue line. And they um, made sure that they uh, uh, made that point uh, and referenced it numerous times. In fact, in the trustees report, there's over um, 17 times that they say, you know, the things in this report are unrealistic and or um, uh, implausible. <clears throat> These forecasts are the same uh, forecasts, but done by the CBO in the same time period. Uh, Pre-ACA, pre-Affordable Care Act, CBO, they have a much, they think healthcare spending will grow much more rapidly uh, than the trustees do. And so you can see that it depends on who, who you uh, look at in terms of who you look at for the forecast. You can see that uh, the CBO is uh, more optimistic about spending growth or less optimistic about uh, the, the cost to the uh, taxpayer. I always like to put this up. You know, when, when we think about to, how long have we known about um, the problems that Medicare might impose on the future? Well, this came from um, 1964, Wilbur Mills. He was talking to the Kiwanis Club, and he said, in practical terms, this is before the passage of uh, uh, Medicare and when Medicare was only being thought of as just hospitalization insurance. He said, in practical terms, this meant that if the hospital insurance uh, system, which would be created by the, uh, the bill, the one that was uh, being considered, was to remain sound, the taxable rate, uh, wage base would have to be increased by $150 each year. Clearly, this would be the case of the tail wagging the dog. Well, that's where we are right now. Uh, and that's maybe where we've been. Uh, the Congress would be left completely hamstrung with two alternatives, a total program that we know is actuarially unsound or a commitment into the indefinite future of, uh, to a steady but wholly uncontrolled increase due to the Part A part of the program. Um, and he says he, he couldn't be part of it. The next year it passed. Um, so I guess the, the, the questions that, uh, you know, when we look at the reforms that are uh, outlined on the demand side that are primarily on the demand side from uh, the, the ones that Mark has outlined and that have already been discussed, will they, will they stick better than the ones that the trustees uh, say, uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen? Um, and I do think that they will. I do think there's a way that we could uh, uh, even build in a benefit formula that's like Social Security's benefit formula that's somehow based on your past earnings so that you can't end up in retirement without having known well what your um, annuity payment might be that goes into um, uh, your uh, uh, paying for your voucher. I think it can be something that's pretty well defined and we can um, – then have something that's both for, that we can forecast and that uh, uh, has uh, 
longer uh, longer legs in terms of uh, staying in force. Uh, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so we're, we started a little light, and now we're running a little light, but that's okay because I built in some excess time for today. Uh, the reception doesn't start till 5.30, uh, so we're going to go just a few minutes over here. I wanted to uh, ask Dr. Pauly to come back up in case anyone has any questions, and then he can also respond to the discussants if he wishes. So um, questions, uh, Dr. Aaron, and then we'll go on the top row. Uh, I have two comments. One is technical and one is broadly philosophical. The technical comment is I think uh, all of the statements that health care is a superior good are wrong and demonstrably wrong based on current research. Uh, it is certainly the case that health care spending has grown more rapidly than income in the past, but the definition of a superior good is not uh, an examination of time series. It's a reference to the income elasticity of demand. And I think the best available research indicates that the income elasticity of demand for healthcare is well under one. So uh, I think uh, it's important to distinguish the source of the growth of healthcare spending, which is partly rising income, partly it's been rapidly increasing insurance coverage, part, uh, and a very large part, as I think everybody has emphasized, <coughs> is technology. That's just the technical point. The um, broader point, though, uh, politicians know that you win the debate and you structure the discussion by the way in which the issue is framed. Uh, this is a conference about the fiscal difficulties that the uh, nation faces in the future. Fiscal difficulties are public expending, spending, uh, less revenues, there's a gap, and we have a problem. But the discussion so far has focused on health care spending. Health care spending isn't just public, it's private plus public. There's a system. And the thing that unites both elements of that system is the fact that uh, the vast majority of Americans today and virtually all of them in the future if the Affordable Care Act takes effect will be insured. And insurance, as we all know, intends to anesthetize the price system. That's what it does. It's built that way. Uh, we've talked about a series of flaws with the way in which we pay for health care we did hope uh, stress those. Uh, the incentive structure uh, is awry. The tax system, which is a public finance aspect, encourages over insurance. Uh, <clears throat> but I think Vivian was correct to emphasize that <coughs> there are a whole range of reforms that need to be undertaken, some on the demand side some in the structure in which, through which we pay for health care. You mentioned bundled payments, uh, accountable care organizations, and so on. Those are equally private and public. They require system-wide reform, not necessarily just public reform. If one is talking, I think rather casually, Mark, as you did, about uh, creating a two-class uh, uh, health care system, you are raising something that is of really fundamental importance given the history of our nation and the fact that 50 years ago, uh, the nation in effect made a commitment to try to produce something approaching standard care even for the elderly, disabled, and poor. Something that had not previously existed. That is a profound commitment and Moving away from it is something that I think uh, we need to think really hard about, uh, and uh, it is a political decision, quintessentially, mm -hmm. more, I think, even than it is an economic decision. And uh, so I think treating it as a, some, somehow as a kind of a mechanical exercise that one uh, would achieve by replacing Medicare with vouchers, for example, um, 
oversimplifies what's involved and I think fails to come to terms with something that's really of profound social, political, and philosophical importance. Why don't we take one more question and then I'll <laughs> let you respond to, to, uh, to Henry and, and the question about. Mine's a little along those lines is that when you have a two-tier system of, of what's going to be paid, what doctors are going to want to be in the lower tier reimbursement world? And if you start getting problems with the choice of physicians moving to where the, the pay is there. And so you, but that. Okay, so let me, uh, let me answer. So I'll start with the most profound question, which is the two-tier, and I, I take it seriously. I don't mean to treat it as just a technical issue. I think it really is a serious problem. I think, Henry, you and I differ, or at least uh, the, in a question, or I guess one way to say it is, I'm, 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 I tried to say this, maybe I didn't say it as well as I should have. I don't want any of these things to happen that I'm talking about. I wish we could continue with the current system where we have single tier for everybody. I just think if I take those excess burdens and run them out, it just can't be sustained in the current version. Uh, so the, the two alternative scenarios, other than the magic scenario, is either a single system constrained by imposed government controls or the market system that I described, and I think the single system may, as I said, actually, like the D.C. public schools, lead to uh, at least more more of a two-tier arrangement than, than others. So I think that is a conversation we need to have. I guess my punchline is this promise or vision we made to ourselves, uh, uh, although I don't remember signing, but uh, 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 at the time of Medicare, um, we could do it then. I don't think we can keep doing it. And I think we need to think of what else we can do that's better. Uh, and I tried to outline what I regard as the most graceful, least painful, best of a bad lot. So um, there is an issue uh, of uh, uh, oh, the income elasticity. Well, I was trying to talk about what happens when people's incomes grow. So I think the right way to think of that is time series, because that's where they grow. As we know, uh, empirically, if you look at how much healthcare spending is higher for a rich person compared to a poor person, the cross section, rich people spend more, but not that much more. That's what Henry was saying. But uh, over time, um, uh, as societies become richer, they spend more at a rate greater than 100%, at least according to most of the estimates, maybe not all. There's some debate about that. Uh, I think part of the reason for the difference, as long as we're arguing, is a point that Amy Finkelstein made about Medicare and cost sharing, that if you just make one person rich and now that person says, I want all sorts of great health care, if they're in a town, and we actually did work on this for the uninsured, if you're in a town with a lot of poor uninsured people, it doesn't matter how rich or how great your insurance is, you're not going to get very much. But if everybody all of a sudden you know, becomes rich, then uh, resources will flood to that town and you will um, you know, have enough health care so you can glow in the dark. Um, uh, the point that, uh, that Vivian made, I think, is right, that, uh, and I was trying to talk about bundling as a step, although I'm an economist, so I'll argue the other side. I think fee-for-service is great if you get the fees right. All the problems I know of with fee-for-service are that the fees are screwed up. If you get the fees right, which is a hard thing to do, and I was on the Physician Payment Review Commission, and I know how hard it was, and we never succeeded in getting the fees down for invasive procedures and up for uh, history and talking to patients. But if you could, you, you could, you can prove, if you knew how many open heart surgeries you wanted for a Medicare population, there's a supply curve out there. There must be a unique fee-for-service price that would just yield the ideal quantity supplied. So, um, and as far as cost sharing goes, of course, I'm in favor of cost, lower cost sharing as a way of controlling healthcare spending growth, although I do need to point out that it's not the only important thing in the world, and if people prefer to have low cost sharing because they're risk averse and high levels of healthcare spending, as long as it's their money, um, I don't see why we should. Um, they don't have to have health savings accounts if they don't want to. I may think it's stupid, but uh, um, that's a good thing about markets. It allows people to be stupid. Um, 
I guess the point uh, that that, um, Andrew made uh, 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 about the Medicare trustees uh, sort of reinforces and and, and reinforces my decision not to talk about that report in great detail, that it all depends on the assumptions that you are willing to make about the effectiveness of these various cost containment devices. And I tend to be pretty much of a skeptic, but as I said, give it a shot. What does make me upset, though, and uh, shakes my faith in the power of capitalism and greed is why private insurers, if this is such a great thing, why haven't they already done it, for Pete's sake? A few have. They were called HMOs, and Hollywood pilloried them. I refuse to debate Denzel Washington about HMOs, but uh, we probably would have talked about bundled payment. But um, but uh, uh, there there is, I, I think, politically, my impression at the moment is that the private insurers are terrified and don't want to get out ahead of Medicare. They want Medicare to take the heat for anything that's going on, but that's that's my amateur politics. Yes, sir. When you address the problem of the tremendous amount of money spent in Medicare during the last six months of elderly people's lives. Yeah. So we don't know it's the last six months until it's too late. That's the flip answer. So. <laughs> yes, but you know what I'm talking sure. about. Sure. So. Yeah. So. So I think there's 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 a there's a there's a serious issue there, and then the, there is a solution that I have, and I'll tell you what it is. So the serious issue is, um, and I can see this happening. I actually have to write something on it. it even if it wasn't Medicare, even if it was just your private wealth, since you can't take it with you, uh, uh, why not spend it on heroic measures? Uh, uh, um, uh, what, what other use does it have? And when it's Medicare, it's even more so. So I, there, that's another one of those profound questions. Is it really my money uh, at that late stage in life? Um, uh, and um, I, I think we probably need to discuss that. I think there is a market-based solution, which I've advocated often, although only to be told that lawyers would never allow it, which is um, what I'll call the prudent care Medicare option. Uh, I could imagine designing a Medicare option where we make explicit our strategy is not to use heroic measures. Uh, And, of course, that would be a cheaper plan, and uh, so people would have an incentive to choose it. But what the lawyers say is, well, if somebody chose that and then they are really sick and there is a heroic measure that might extend their life, I will claim they couldn't have known what they were doing when they signed up with that plan because nobody in their right mind would sign away the right to have resources spent on them. Now, if we can figure out how to run that, uh, uh, solve that problem, um, I think it is a possible. Uh, I guess I, I, I really do blanch, even uh, not even thinking of Sarah Palin in the back of my mind, but think about the government making a decision of when to pull the plug. But um, if you're willing to sign up for my pull-the-plug HMO, uh, that's okay with me. And uh, that is, I think, I mean that to be somewhat serious, I think creating a variety of options, as I already hinted, uh, across health plans that would allow people to make those choices that um, government can't make because it's politically uh, death to make them, to turn them over to individuals, probably the best way to go. Uh, And um, um, so that part at least makes me optimistic.